last time we made a video on honor, we got quite the response, but there was a lot of questions. What's the problem? What's the problem? Maybe I was too vague. Maybe I didn't go into it blunt enough. Kept my cards a little too close to the uh, chest. Well, this is the rebuilds now. We're going in for the new blunt approach. You better comment. You better like, subscribe, and support me on Patreon if you can, because today it's about authorship. Last time I said that was more about creativity, burnout, and how that's affected by mental health. But what happens when you get to the other side of it? When you become a massive success, you could do no wrong and you're considered a creative genius in the world of animation and live action film. Well, that's usually what you call an auteur, but that in itself is a big fat lie. And we're gonna get into exactly why today. Japanese anime has depended on the fantasy of autourism made up by Toshio Suzuki. That's why Mia-san and I became directors. There were many directors who were better than me. I could not have become a director without the fantasy of autourism. It is nothing but an exercise in branding, just like the title, huh? Mm -hmm. You see, Arno is a disciple of Miyazaki and thus Suzuki, and he's been happy to take this concept throughout his entire career and use it to his benefit. You see, Suzuki's bringing it as an alleged fan of Kaede Cinema, and he's brought it from the perspective of someone who was at one time a publisher, producer, kind of tabloid area. It's all to him a selling tool. And even before he met them, Arno's always had kind of the eyes of an auteur, especially when we think about Return of Ultraman. So there was an Arno dispute on the set of Return of Ultraman. Arno promised he would edit the film during the holidays, but after the holidays he said, sorry, I got drunk with my friends. Other staff discussed the problems with Okada, who was then the head of Daikon, and they wanted to fire Arno. Especially Akai, who had done most of the production on that tokusatsu, he was pretty angry. Okada then apparently fired Arno at a cafe, and it said he didn't move an inch in that cafe for about half a day. So Okada's perspectives aren't usually the most trustworthy in the world, but Akai has confirmed this in his own little interview, where he said Arno called it my film. He took ownership for something that he didn't do much for, but leave them in a complete mess. So in the end of the day, I'm afraid the reality is no match for the legend. And when that fan film is coming to Amazon Japan, it's not going there because Okai has a new project to promote. No, 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 no. There's only one person in this story who could have made that happen on an official platform. And I think we all know who that is. Now, like, look, I'm not saying this is some kind of malicious thing, but it is very calculated. And it is there to create an internal narrative that is compelling to the audience. It draws them in. So now let us talk about Shin Ultraman and the many other people in that production that made it possible. And then eventually we'll get back to Arno. I mean, come on, he's not going anywhere. You can wait. Right, so I mean, if you're looking just for my basic thoughts on Shin Ultraman, I, I liked it, I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, it's not like Shin Godzilla. I mean, I think maybe aesthetically it is, but the kind of story it's trying to tell is much different than doing something similar to a prior movie. It's trying to do something similar to a the whole TV show, it's trying to condense a lot of story in there, which makes it probably a bit more niche. I think the character in South Ultraman is much more niche than Godzilla to begin with. You know, he's the guy from space. He accidentally bodies a man and then he becomes that man and now he is defender of earth from giant kaijus and aliens and such uh that is the story of ultraman if you didn't know yeah exciting eh it's more of a tokusatsu experience you could say now what is tokusatsu well in japanese that means special effects or can be kind of like a special film usually those are films pioneered around the time of godzilla in 1954 that have pretty big special effects. The reason that film basically exists is because, well, big old rubber suits is a lot cheaper than doing stop motion or other animation techniques. And it was a way to create the illusion of these sort of ideas through miniatures, through explosions, through these big heavy suits that people have to wear, through the angle of the camera making everything seem lower and smaller. And that's all crazy stuff happening, right? You know, you've got a set everywhere, everything's going down. Look at the amount of people on set. It's you got A, you got B, C, but D, he's here, and E, F, G. Um. Hey, Jai, I, I don't think it goes much further than that. And Shin Ultraman is still the same at its core, but now let's get into Shinji Higuchi, the actual director who has years upon years of years of tokusatsu experience, and he worked his way all the way up from special effects director to now actual live action director. He's also one of Arno's oldest colleagues, 
They met because of that return of Ultraman short. It is through Ultraman that the bond they still have today was formed. Even though he had nothing to do with that fan film's production, he has quite a lot to do with the Shin production. Shin Godzilla, Higuchi was really the general director of that film. He was on set the whole time, and Anna was bad with the crew, and he had a very stressful time, and he wasn't there in person most of the time because of that. Higuchi kept the peace though. At that point, Anna was closer to like a special effects director, working on the digital side. <laughs> Cutie Honey was Arno's only, like, theatrical tokusatsu. It was a proto-Shin movie, an attempt to revive the 70s flair of the original, but it struggled with the finances and inexperience of its crew. It was not exactly as hotly received as his other resurrections. These newer movies would not have been possible without Higuchi's team and their decades of experience. There's no other way around it. This wasn't an auteur experience. Those shows stunned me and kind of messed up my life. Until I became an adult, to my generation, Ultraman represents the future. The original series was an aspirational fantasy. It was an era of the Japanese economic miracle, from the Olympics to the industrial strength of Japan's manufacturing. There was reasons to be optimistic about the future. Shin Ultraman plans to revive the spirit of the original series, with that philosophy of the dreams of children. But now it's kind of trying to balance it alongside the more grounded, what if kaiju were real approach of the prior Shin films. Of course, things are going to change when you go from an episodic TV show for children to a big theatrical production. And there's a sort of give and pull between the new ideas that Higuchi wants to do and the old ideas Arno is set on. So I think that maybe the balance was somehow the conflicts between myself and Mr. Arno, or the difference in terms of how we approached it. We found a balance there. So the film itself was announced in 2019, around the summer, hoping to get out in 2021 sometimes, but because of COVID, the film itself became almost as big as Ultraman, with about two and a half years of splicing it together, and it's quite the commitment when you think of it like that. I haven't done a production myself that's went longer than like 11 months, and that was kind of a hell. With Shin Ultraman, it was made during COVID, and the release date kept getting extended, so we had a lot of time to work on the CG for Shin Ultraman, and keep improving it. In terms of Japanese film CG, it was probably the most amount of time, maybe even more than the States, because the time can be limited. I was able to work on Ultraman to my heart's content, and that was something really satisfying to me. There is far more leeway than the original show ever had, where you had to work all night. The charm of its handcrafted ingenuity, though it cannot compete on the scale of international productions, it doesn't really need to, because the imagination is so boundless. It's all about the ideas and the fast experimenting of young people trying to do anything they can. There is no grand vision, it is all trial and error through a compromised shooting schedule. Tokusatsu is one of the most insane collaborations because so many pieces are needed to make it work. And if they don't, the entire thing's gonna fall apart. All it takes is one row of the special effects director. Higuchi would end up storyboarding a bunch of the fight scenes here too, as well as editing them during the COVID period. But he wasn't the only one on the film when it comes to boarding. There was just a stack of them. There are some shots here that look a little bit like Ava. Specifically, I guess, episode 14. I wonder who's on board on that episode. Oh, I, I guess it's Hideaki Anno. So I, maybe he boarded those scenes. And that's entirely possible, but also maybe wrong, because I've lied to you. Because this scene is blatantly just Ultraman all along. <laughs> Specifically, Akio Jisoji. And it's true that Arno does wear his influences on his sleeves at times. Especially when we're talking about this fella. When he comes into the world of Ultraman episode 14, it changes the game visually. And while the episode is quite silly and it has kind of a strange message behind it, it is always striking aesthetically. The man has no conventional shot reverse shot stuff. He always is using some surreal imagery and going past the point of realism. And there's definitely some uncomfortable close-ups put in there. He'll always point the camera where the hell ever he wants in the scenery. And that's what makes his stuff pretty endearing. And I believe the director and writer agree. The film takes this approach to heart, even using iPhones to try and push the obscure angles to the max. However, Jisoji was not alone. To make a tokusatsu takes a very large crew behind you, and they were all working at Tsuburaya's productions. Ultraman was based off some initial concepts from Eiji Tsuburaya himself, and they were unused stuff from mainly Ultra Q, and they were there to try and get some use out of these old Godzilla sets. While he wasn't on the front lines, it was his studio, and he let those young staff just try things out. So for example, the original designer, Tol Narita. There is a story behind this painting here from 1983. 
that this was what he wanted the design of Ultraman to originally look like, but was harpered by what the production wanted at that time. And Shin is now basically trying to resurrect that original intention, really with a lot of his designs, because it wasn't possible to create them one-to-one -one in the 60s. So for example, Sarab, that was a design that Arno really took some interest in because that's one of his favorite episodes. On top of that, they would full scan the original Ultraman suit actor, Bin Furaya, because his unique proportions were just so fundamental to the look of the character. They couldn't get away from it. We have time called Step Inside the Zone. Hit them hard. I'm coming back with a blast. I'm coming back with a blast. I'm coming back to the blast And that I love how it sucks to lean I'm getting back here on this spot Like my illusion, I have a dream Instagram, I love me, the number one That's what I see Hard to the E to the A to the K to the E to the R You see, now eat the greatest So fantastic, yeah Wherever there is danger, I'll be there You got Sadao Isuka this guy was an optical effects master when it came to the Spacium Beam and many other tokusatsu stuff. He did all that by hand, with inks, on paper that were then processed through film. And he kept doing that for his entire career. Although he was never really credited during the Ultraman period because of some bureaucracy. But he is credited for his work in Shin Ultraman, specifically in recreating the Spacium Beam like he did back 50 years ago. Although, allegedly, he never really was too bothered about not being credited because it was all about the final product to the people who were working back then. <laughs> then what about the sound? Well, it wasn't enough for the people on the production to sort of reorchestrate or sort of reference old sounds. They had to use the originals from the source. Those sounds can be replaced by hi-fi or more realistic sounds. It occupies an important position in my life. It's a voice that speaks or a guitar riff in the music. I thought of that memory of those sounds, which was very important. So I tried to use those old sounds. And while a lot of that does come from the branding of how the Shin films have been prior, I do think there's an element of earnestness when you bring in people from the original series to participate again feels a little more authentic, especially with Higuchi's words here. Especially since, is there really an executive alive who's gonna go, yeah, show all that crusty mono music and sound effects in our film, that's certainly not gonna scare away the children. One of the most underappreciated people in the production has to be Iki Todoroki. While he first met Arno as a fan, he then became his assistant and has worked his way up from there, now becoming a deputy director. And Arno takes a lot of Todoroki's input in when creating his works. Most of his work on Shin Ultraman involved being in control of the virtual cameras alongside Masayuki. And Masayuki himself, an incredibly important, fundamental person in a lot of Arno's works, being the director of the second half of End of Ava, to name one thing. And there have always been people like that alongside Arno. And he admits as much himself when he talks about the original television series. It just turned out like that. I guess it's because I was trying to incorporate ideas from many people around. It just went in that direction. I didn't mind. It was okay the way it went too. Maybe the influence of Maki and Masa was big, right? Yeah, and also others like Mr. Satsukawa, Inokido, Shin-chan, and Mr. Honda. Mr. Iso and a lot of others are all mixed in me. Kara's involvement is not to be sort of ignored, and there's just so many people on the production, it's hard to really get a grasp of it all, especially until the more behind the scene documents come out to sort of break it down even further. So let's talk about Arno in relation to a lot of those people. Now he's a pretty soft touch director. He's like a picky eater, that's usually what you hear. A lot of it to him comes from more of a producer-like role. He kind of cuts around the edges and refines down, you know, like an editor, and he was the co-editor on the production. And yes, he does have quite a lot of credits on here, specifically being the only one credited for screenwriting. But knowing what I do about Arno's prior productions, when it says one person, it just means a bunch of people are uncredited. Because I know for a fact that Higuchi would have been involved considering he was bringing ideas to the table, and Iki Todoroki is always involved in the screenwriting process as feedback, considering he's seen as that fan perspective. There are usually also a creative assemble of other people who will be consulted and brought back and forth on that scripting process. So basically back to the authorship angle, it's always about taking credit for work that isn't all your own. 
And how could we forget about the original series, as Shin Ultraman takes about five episodes of it and turns it into its narrative. And a lot of critics have talked about how it felt episodic to its detriment. But it is more about how they connect all those pieces together. But I suppose what really is tokusatsu about special effects, and Arno was very much part of the pre-viz process. And while that pre-viz process on Shin Godzilla ended up pretty close to what Arno originally created, now they're using new techniques with real-time capturing and virtual cameras within game engines. There's plenty of extra stuff here, similar to what happened in Shin where they can take hundreds of angles all at once. And Arno is involved in refining that down to a more respectable number, but really it is the team who has to then whittle through it to make the final production, going through countless shots that are captured, involving a trial and error process that goes back to the foundation of what Tokusatsu is all about. But now they have the power of motion capture, but gives them a bit more control when it comes to the fights. They don't have to necessarily worry about the struggle of wearing big heavy old suits that might obscure your vision, just tight lycra I guess. Yes, this also lets a 60 something anime director take part in the process in a way where he can refer back to himself and his youth for subtle marketing. Because Shin Ultraman is a product of Arno's brand. When you look at Shin Ultraman, he wants you to think Arno. And what better way to do that than put up in the motion capture yourself? And it goes back to the narrative of fanboy to visionary, how dreams do come true. You even see that in his own exhibition. And that is the auteur vision they are literally selling you. But Arno isn't the only one who takes the motion capture on. He can't do all the stunt work. So the character animation supervisor, Shuhei Kumamoto, is the one that did most of the choreography and figuring out how these kaiju battles would work. It's really on them and the team. Even if they start with some of Arno's storyboards to sort of figure out the key poses, a lot of it afterwards is mixing it with the previous and seeing what works. But when it comes to editorializing the film, you sometimes see this talked about in terms of the authorship. It's brought up in this movie article where they are comparing three different groups. We have Arno the auteur, we have the tightly knit group of Godzilla, and then the Marvel-led films, which they see as kind of a corporate version where a lot of the heavy work is offshoot onto the post-production crew at a poor wage, uh, with you know very little control by the creative visionaries. Now, I don't necessarily disagree that that's what happens, I guess, in the Marvel method, but I don't necessarily also think you can't see a lot of those criticisms applied to either of those others because you know when it comes to toku or you know prior anime it is definitely the poorly paid people towards the end that are the ones that have to do most of the heavy lifting and ultraman has the luck of time on its side strictly because of covid it could have been much more rushed really i see these productions all kind of in the same corporate landscape the only difference really is how much money were they given and how much control do they get because of that? We immediately ran into a practical problem. We didn't have as big a budget as those American Monsterverse films, so we couldn't really destroy the world like they did. We tried to compensate by coming up with a uniquely appealing screenplay and really interesting characters. While some of the reviews weren't able to see the political context here, like in the prior Shin movies, I think there's definitely a lot of contemporary commentary going on here, especially when it comes to the fear of invasion all over it, and the geopolitics of alliances and conflict. Japan is constantly looking for a way to one-up, and maybe you can even see that with them increasing US budgets of recent years. But even then, the pressures of having an Ultraman-like figure, you know, some sort of protector, brings a lot of attention to the other nations interesting how they can balance that while also being authentic to the original series. Sure, there's a bunch of referencing to it. In fact, one of the key ones is done in such a thematically potent way, bringing it all back to Ultraman's core concept. The ending isn't a big fight between an ultimate weapon and Ultraman edging out a victory. It is a victory of mankind's ingenuity. It's an inspiring message that could be read as a rejection of the great man ideal, or auteur itself, all in favour of the collective fighting together to achieve the unachievable, very much reflecting the tokusatsu production method. Although aesthetically, that final image calls back to Gunbuster, and when we fall back into that branding idea, because it needs to relate back to Arno's history. And you can see this again in Shin Kamen Rider's original trailer. They're shooting in Ube. Is that because it reflects Arno's soul, or is it just to benefit that old industrial town? Has this simply become a signal that you are now watching an Arno movie? It's part of that narrative that some people like to spin. So 
ふるさとを取材したらどうですかそこにねその秘密を解き明かしてくれる so... I think this is about time that we reveal that Arno is the marketing supervisor, of course, of the Shin universe, especially when it comes to the newly announced Shin Japan Heroes universe, which is selling you toys, tie-ins, and novelty bars at your expense, which are all built off this kind of insincere version of Arno's narrative. But it, it all kind of worked, didn't it? I mean, Shin Ultraman has the biggest box office of any Ultraman film ever and it's also brought a whole new generation to the tokusatsu that probably wouldn't have been interested if arno's name wasn't like plastered on it and it worked on me too because i watched the original series and watched this movie and made the video about it and i don't regret it and now i know the beautiful story of episode two of ultraman where he just just genocides a whole entire race uh because he can <laughs> rest in peace bolton one two three <laughs> Zip. We could also talk about how there is a spin-off revival brought back by Higuchi here. Ultra Fight, as it's known, will be put on the Blu-ray as an incentive to get more of those physical releases. And there are some episodes of this on their official website, and it's kind of cute how they've taken footage from the film, they've turned it 4 by 3 and made it look like stock footage, changed the colors, added noise. But really, this comes together when it gets to the original content, where they start using Unreal 4 Engine with real-time rendering and mocap, and try and just emulate the process of a cheap stock 70s tokusatsu. And they just go absolutely absurd with it. You know, they capture that style right to a T, which means you get all the camp and absurdity you can imagine. This is basically just toku wrestling. I mean, look at this. And now he's staring him down. What, what's this fella gonna do? Oh my God! He's, there's two of them! There's two of them! There's a fake Ultraman! What a, oh my God, what a kick! Good Lord, what a crash! What a crash! For the future of Ultraman, we know from the pitch document there's at least two more films coming and they're going to be based on different franchises for the series and I'm looking forward to it, I'll say that much. But when we get back to Arno and his alternatorship, there's definitely a difference between what you say and what you do. Even if Arno does present himself to be more producer-like in his later years, and some have confirmed that, and yes, Arno does stuff. It's not like he, he's not involved. He has a level, he has a you know sprinkling of all these other random small roles too, but he's one of hundreds of this crew and mainly someone who is creating their work to make it feel like a Shin production. All within the limits of time, budget, and production. Yeah, that's Dilemma. I mean, it's effectively, we can't understand the soul of Arno. It's basically an illusion. We know nothing about this man. So when we talk about it as his personal journey or something, we're falling into a trap. And those traps, effectively, especially in criticism, are pretty much making it either adoration or that you just absolutely detest this one person they've ruined your favorite franchise instead of talking about the reality of how you make something in this field especially which usually is about the creative odyssey of hundreds of people working very hard to try and make something in the end which seems almost impossible but i get it's daily <laughs> it is absolutely very much easier to uh envision that creative genius idea but really it's nothing but an illusion just like yeah all fake yeah just like this out, see so there's a little prop on her it's not really here eh? Yeah, see it's a little, little guy it took me way too long to make this thing too see yeah. yeah like what are you gonna do to me huh that's a tough thing are you And maybe I'll return in Shin the Kamen Rider if I'm not dead, but if you don't want the channel to die, you can always support it to keep the lights on, and check out the Patreon and other ways to support down below. Gotta give a shout out to Lenny though, because uh, I forgot to update his status, he went up to $10, that's usually the shout out phase, incredibly uh, appreciative of what he's done. He's supported the channel a lot of different ways in the past, and he's always pretty active in the Discord, so I have to really give him a shout out for that. You know, Lenny, you're one of the million. I fucked up. I think everyone needs to give Lenny a congratulations for his just generally great support and also give him a shout out in the comments if you've gotten this far. You have to. I mean, congratulations, Lenny. Come on, let's give him a friend. Come on, let's, let's, let's go. Let's go. And there's a couple other new patrons coming in at $10, but we've got Tim, James, Richards, and Cell Swords. Of course, the classics with Joven, Daniel Strait, Ascaral, Stratagen, Stratos, Chunks, Jay, Fox Mulder, who also recommended The Blast for that one scene here that I've used. OT, Paul, Steven's Mum, Subsofa, Takuki Suzuki, Systematic, and Doji. Now, 
Speaking of Patreon stuff, I did a poll ages ago for the next Ghibli video, and I think it's about time I saw that out. So Princess Mononoke should be up next. <laughs>